These things never start the way you expect them to. You want to be able to see them happening. See the oncoming train or bus bearing down on you to wipe you from the face of the earth. See the evil spirits gaining on you, because when you can see it coming, you can plan an escape. When you can see the path wrought with danger, you can be objective, and also see the way out to safety. You never expect to be blindsided. Never expect to step off the curb when the light says it's your turn to cross the road, only to be run down. My point is that I should have seen this coming. In fact, I did. I've been having these dreams for the past three years. Dreams where I'm walking through a forest on the edge of town, following a flickering light in the distance, only to be led into a den filled with nightmarish creatures, where it will start out peaceful, and I'll be watching the surf pull in and out from the shoreline on a beach. Then in the distance, I'll see a figure standing on the horizon. A distant fog obscures his features. He raises an object over his head, and it shines as bright as a newborn sun, before the distant fog rushes to land as fast as someone blowing the hot steam away from a fresh coffee cup. In the dream, I am engulfed by the fog, and hands begin grabbing at me. Their skin is cold and slimy as they push me into the waters, the muck filling my lungs. And then I wake up. These dreams always fill me with a sort of urgency, as though I'm meant to act on them, as though they're trying to lead me to something, tell me something. I'm, I'm no psychic. I just happen to know things. Things I shouldn't really know. Like the incident in Tokyo that was being reported all over the news. The night it happened, I had this dream that I was on a subway. And not just any subway. THE subway. The train car is in the middle of its commute when there's a rumbling all around us. A few of us, including myself, begin to complain at the inconvenience of it all. Why today, of all days, does there have to be an earthquake? I can hear some commuters praying that it doesn't delay the other train cars. But then the rumbling becomes worse, and I can see some of the other travelers turn from irritated to concerned. This isn't an ordinary earthquake. Our train car lurches forward, and some people fall into each other as they struggle to right themselves. Outside the car, I can hear people screaming. Their cries are mingling with other sounds that I had only ever heard in my dreams. Now where we were all once standing, everyone is dropping to the floor as the glass windows are being shattered. The platform we had stopped at had been overrun with creatures that appeared to have once been human. Their clothing is covered in a sticky, oozing black liquid that seems to have seeped into their skin. Strange tentacle-like appendages protrude from their heads and their backs, whipping back and forth in an agitated manner. Their eyes, their eyes emit a, a strange orange glow, and their voices have distorted as they speak in manic tones. I watched as one creature lunged at a woman, pulling out her hair, screaming in that manic way, Tell me I'm pretty! Her victim screamed, trying to escape, but she held her fist in the woman's hair. I'm sorry, she screamed. I'm sorry, I have to do this. The possessed woman then punched her arm into the victim's stomach, taking a handful of her intestines and ripping them out of her. I stared in horror, unable to look away from the scene, before the man beside me began frantically pushing away from me, knocking me into another passenger as he struggled in his own escape. 
The possessed creatures were now making their way onto our car. Passengers were screaming, horrible, desperate, raw screams, like from the pit of hell. The voices of the damned mingling with the voices of those who would damn them. The possessed were jumping on the car, throwing themselves on top of the other passengers. They dug their fingers into flesh, ripping and screaming and killing. Part of me wondered if it was that black oozing liquid on their skin that made them act this way. A sort of filth or bacteria that infected them. Just go, please go away, go away, don't stay here, screamed one of the filthy creatures as he began clawing at another man's shoulders. The black filth started to cover the other man as he clawed at his flesh. I was trapped, caught in a mass of people trying to flee. In the distance, I could hear others fighting and the sounds of metal clashing with metal. Don't let it get on you. Don't even breathe in, one woman shouted. The filth, the infection. Someone grabs me and I turn face to face with one of them. I see them. The filth woman says to me. Her fingers curled tightly around my forearm. The red eyes, the whispers, they promise death and darkness. Oh God! She screams, and her fingernails dig into my skin. Hot, sticky liquid wells from my fresh wounds. I'm bleeding, and the black ooze is beginning to mingle with it. I can't sleep, the woman cries. I keep waking up. The dreams. They're always there when I close my eyes. Always there. They're always there. I can feel the filth to cover me. I barely feel the pain now when she rips off my arm. All I feel is shock and rage. Now the screams of the other passengers are being drowned out by dark and distorted whispers. I don't get to hear what they're saying. The filth-infected woman knocks me to the floor and stabs me in the chest with a pair of sewing scissors. I wake up, gasping for breath. The bed sheets around me are soaked with my own sweat, and I lay there a while, thankful for the open window and the smell of fresh rainfall, the sound of it soothing my unquiet mind. I sit up in bed, feeling the sweat sodden sheets. It had been a long while since I'd had a bad one like this. I take a few deep breaths and stand, gathering the damp sheets to take to the laundry. I can't help but turn on the lights as I go, the warm glow comforting as they drive away the shadows of the night. Once my bed sheets are into the washing machine and the dial is turned, I go toward my kitchen. The clock tells me that it's four in the morning, now too early to call Josie about my dreams, but I know that I won't be able to get back to sleep. So I grab the coffee grounds and set about making a pot. The routine motions are beginning to drive away the chill of the nightmare when I hear my phone ring from my bedroom. The programmed ringtone tells me that I have an email. I go down the hallway into my room to retrieve the phone. A cursory glance tells me that there's been an explosion somewhere in Japan. Two more minutes and my coffee will be ready. I'll sink into the soft cushions of my sofa, mug in hand, and read all about this new tragedy that the world has to offer. I look at the headline again, and am struck by it. Tokyo Public, devastated by explosion on subway. Tokyo. Explosion. Subway. The glowing eyes of the filth-possessed woman and her panicked voice echo in my mind. The article states that an earthquake occurred after an explosion had been set underground. No suspects had been identified as of yet, and the missing persons list was in the hundreds. The breaking story was still ongoing and the death toll was confirmed at 30 people so far. My hands were shaking. I put my phone down and picked up my coffee mug, then went to the sofa and turned on the TV flipping channels until I came across a station playing old Three's Company reruns. Three hours passed in a blur. I must have fallen asleep at one point. When I jumped back awake, my phone was playing the soundtrack to some video game. Josie was calling me. I stood up and stumbled over to the kitchen, still feeling somewhat drowsy. 
Hello? I muttered sleepily. Damn, are you okay? What happened last night? She sounded concerned. I tried to think back to the events of last night. I didn't remember anything particularly exciting. Nothing that Josie should remember anyway. What do you mean? I asked her. I got a voicemail from you at around three in the morning. You were muttering something about voices and red eyes. Then you started cussing me out and listing groceries. It sounded like a schizophrenic with Tourette's, she said. Are you okay? She asked me again. But hold on a second. I stared at my phone in confusion as I looked up my call history. Sure enough, the evidence glared back at me from the screen. 3 a.m. I'm sorry. I don't even remember doing that. I had a crazy nightmare last night. I rubbed my forehead. Shame blossomed on my cheeks. It was the first time I did anything physical in my unconscious state. I knew I talked in my sleep. Josie had told me this on one of our numerous movie marathon nights. Scared the shit out of her. But then my dreams are rarely not scary. That explains it, Josie sighed heavily into the phone. You want to talk about it? I don't even know where to start. I walked back over to the couch to see a preview for the news coming up next on the television. Coverage from the incident in Tokyo. My heart began thudding against my chest at some of the images being shown. Caved-in entrances covered in the same black ooze. The filth. C can you come over? I said, and my voice sounded small to my own ears. I'm on my way, she said. She was the only one who knew about my strange ability. Again, I'm not a psychic. I just happen to know things. See things. Wow. That sounds like a psychic. I shook my head and turned off the TV. They were showing scientists taking samples of the ooze for analysis. I was afraid of what they would find. I ended up going back to that news article on my phone. My curiosity got the best of me. When Josie finally got there, she found me crying while poring over the list of deceased. I didn't know one of them, but I had seen them. They were all in my dream. The one that spooked me the most? A filth-possessed woman was among them, smiling sweetly in the photo provided by the family members, no doubt. I was there! I said to her pacing in the living room. My voice was thick with emotion as my memory recalled the dream with perfect clarity. Most people can't do that with their dreams. I can. Josie was reading and rereading the article. What station did the car stop at? She asked me. I could tell she was testing me. She always did. Shikoku. The station sign loomed over my head, strange black growths peering where ever the news touched. She looked up at me, grim-faced, and turned the phone to me. She had another page open, showing the names of trains that were caught in the earthquake. The train for Shikoku was one of them. Jade, I think you need to talk to someone, Josie said quietly. I scoffed. Talk to someone? Who? Who would believe this shit? A psychic, she stated matter-of-factly. I groaned. No, listen to me. Not just some hack, but an honest-to-goodness psychic. Josie, there's no such thing, I said, running my fingers through my hair. Oh, no, she said, flipping on the TV. The news anchor was reporting on the strange black ichor that was found at the site. Okay, I said, frustration rising. Okay, and how do you plan on weeding out the fake ones from the real ones, huh? Tell me where is this honest-to-goodness psychic? Josie waited. I've been seeing one for the past two months. God, Josie. I shook my head. How much are you paying her? That doesn't matter. What matters is that this one is real. I made sure, she stated. How? I dropped onto the couch beside her again. This psychic knew about Larry, she said, looking down at her lap. Are you sure you weren't somehow projecting? These people are wizards at reading people. Josie was silent for a moment. I don't know. 
I don't think so. I groaned again. What do you have to lose? My money, I sighed. What else? I looked at her and was silent for a few beats. I want to know how much this will cost me before I even set foot in that crazy shop of hers. His, Josie corrected. His name is Marco, 